Well, good evening, Storm Nation. Uh, my name is Brad Bergstrom. I'm lucky enough to be the superintendent here at Sauk Rapids Rice Public Schools. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, storm forecast for Wednesday, September 2nd. Uh, it's hard to believe, but in less than a week, we'll be back in school. And uh, today I was in my office uh, and watching uh, students and family come into uh, Sauk Rapids Rice High School and and it warmed my heart to, to see uh, people coming into the buildings and as part of the open house piece and uh, it's great to see kids back uh, whether it be in activities or coming back into buildings I know there's a lot of open house things going on tonight uh, so just uh, again just great to have everybody there just want to check here to make sure that uh, everybody can hear me and see me hold on one second please I got the thumbs up. Okay, we're good to go. So um, uh, again, welcome tonight. Uh, I've got uh, a couple of things that I wanna make sure that I go through. First of all, our purpose for tonight is I'm gonna answer some questions that I've been receiving as well as clarify a statement that I made last week uh, that uh, turns out was incorrect. And before I get to those, just housekeeping items uh, for those who may be joining for the first time. Uh, if you have questions, please put them into the comment section and we will be, uh, we've got people here monitoring and we'll try to get those questions answered for you uh, as quickly as we possibly can. I may not get to all of them and if I don't, we'll certainly put those into our frequently asked questions document, which again, please continue to visit that uh, on our website as there's updated information that goes there as often as we can. And then also don't forget to continue to look at our safe learning plan. Uh, again, we continue to make updates to that as we get more updated information. Information and I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in just uh, in a few minutes in terms of some updates that we've got. So continue to go back to that. The one thing that COVID-19 has taught us is that there's a constant, and that constant is change. And uh, if you think something is going to go a particular way for a long period of time, uh, just stick around a little bit and it more than likely will change. So with that, um, <clears throat> just the last piece I want to remind everybody of is this is an opportunity for people to get information. And uh, sometimes you may not like uh, the answer or the response. Hopefully I'm doing so in a respectful manner, but just to be kind and be, and be uh, graceful with each other tonight. Uh, as we uh, as we go through these uh, again, it's an opportunity for people to get questions asked to them So a couple of questions that I've been asked and I want to clarify number one is last week uh, I made mention of the fact that coughing was no longer uh, a symptom uh, for COVID-19 to be looking for uh, and while that may have been the case a little earlier that coughing has come back on as a symptom CDC has it uh, also the Minnesota Department of Health has put that piece on there so uh, coughing is one of the symptoms uh, for COVID-19 I apologize for the inaccurate information again talking about the change piece the second thing I want to talk about is is a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, face coverings and uh, the, the question of gaiters came up, the question of face shields came up, and we didn't have a whole lot of um, direction in terms of what those two pieces are gonna look like. So I'll start with gaiters. Uh, gaiters are still acceptable. Uh, we're gonna be putting that back onto our safe learning plan. In fact, we've had some email conversations with members of the administrative team today, and we'll try to make sure that gets put back onto our, our document and until uh, we get information that says otherwise. The other piece that I wanted to clarify and talk about is face shields. And, and I'm gonna read uh, some information that was uh, shared uh, with uh, administration and, and superintendents uh, from around the state um, on uh, uh, yesterday and that information uh, says uh, says the following that face shields should be used in addition to a face mask and again this information will go into our safe learning plan and should generally not be used as a replacement for a face mask okay so I'll repeat that uh, face shields should be used in addition to a face mask and should generally not be used as a replacement for a face mask and an excerpt from the CDC says a face shield is primarily used for eye protection for the person wearing it. At this time, it is not known what level of protection a face shield provides to people nearby from the spray of respiratory droplets from the wearer. There is currently not enough evidence to support the effectiveness of face shields for source control. Therefore, the CDC does not currently recommend use of face shields as a substitute for masks. Now, having said that, 
Now, the Department of Health has also added a face shield or clear plastic barrier that covers the face, allows the visibility of facial expressions and lip movements for speech perception, and may be used as an alternative to face coverings in the following situations. So again, CDC is saying face shields are not a substitute for a mask, okay? Because we're not, they're not unaware of where the, the effectiveness of a face shield. However, there are some uh, examples where a face shield will work. And again, we've got some further guidance from the Department of Health with that. And it says, uh, among students in kindergarten through eighth grade, when wearing a face covering is problematic. Again, that gets back to we're expecting a face covering for all of our students, our staff, our visitors, uh, unless there is medical documentation. And uh, that needs to be shared with district administration and, and uh, to be approved. And so again, it doesn't mean that everybody can now begin to wear a face shield in K through eight. No, it's not saying that at all, but it's when there is a uh, face covering is problematic. Uh, by teachers in all grades, when wearing a face covering may impede the educational process. So for example, uh, if there is a speech teacher who is working with a student who is receiving special education services for speech and the seeing the sp speech teacher enunciate and move their uh, their mouth is, is critically important or for the student, for the teacher to be able to see that, then a face shield could work in that process. Okay, it's not a, there's no hard and fast rule with this. Uh, there are also some face coverings out there now that do have clear in the middle of them and we're trying to get our hands on as many of them as we possibly can uh, so that we can have them be available for people if they might need them, but they're tough to come by right now. Uh, so, and then the third piece is for staff, students, or visitors who cannot tolerate a face covering due to a developmental, medical, or behavioral health condition. And again, that's been a consistent piece. We need it from a, we need medical documentation. Uh, I've been asked questions like, um, does a dentist, if I get a note from a dentist uh, to exempt from face covering, will that work? And the answer to that is no, they're not considered to be a medical authority uh, in this instance right here. Uh, same thing with a doctor of chiropractor. They're, they're great people and, and, and they do a wonderful service. But in this case right here, they're not considered to be a medical authority, uh, so those would not work. It needs to come from uh, a, a medical doctor, uh, a school psychologist, et cetera, uh, those who are, are, would be considered to be a medical authority. So just clarifying that a little bit as well. And then again, for staff providing direct student support services when face covering impedes the service being provided. So in the end, uh, a face shield will not be a substitute for a face mask, uh, according to the CDC and the Department of Health. Minnesota Department of Health, there are some exemptions. If you think your child is uh, part of that exemption, I encourage you to reach out to administration in your child's building. Uh, this will be uh, a rarity. It's not something that's gonna happen on a regular basis and documentation from a medical authority will be needed uh, in order to, uh, to support a face shield being in place of a face mask. Um, for optimal protection, face shields should extend below the chin uh, anteriorly to the ears laterally, and there should be no exposed gap between the forehead and the shield's headpiece. So sometimes you'll see a face shield that's right here. It would need to cover the forehead. So just clarification uh, in terms of what we've just received from the Department of Health, as well as coming to us from the CDC, and wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Next topic uh, I want to talk about is uh, we're getting closer to the start of the school year. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have Voights uh, be our new transportation provider for, for uh, buses uh, in the district. And uh, uh, in talking with our transportation coordinator, uh, information about busing should have gone out today. Uh, if you didn't get it today, check tomorrow. Uh, it is being sent out through Skyward. Uh, and I, I do believe that if you signed up for an electronic piece uh, with transportation, you'll get that as well. Uh, if not, if you didn't sign up for those, uh, then you may be getting it um, uh, in a different format. Uh, but again, my understanding is through Skyward that in communication came out today. Uh, and if you didn't get it, please be looking for that or check your spam uh, in your email if um, uh, in, ca in case it went to there. But we should that information was scheduled to have gone out today. Uh, in regards to that. 
The other piece in talking with our transportation folks, we started using a an app last year, I believe it was last year, called MyStop. And what it did is it gave a GPS update in terms of where your child's bus is at. Um, we have switched bus companies and they use a different GPS uh, firm than what the previous company did. Uh, throughout the course of the summer, there's been conversations with the GPS company and our transportation scheduler. Uh, we are optimistic that those things have been solved in terms of between the two companies, nothing to do with the school or with parents. And we are hoping that my stop will be available for parents and families uh, on the first day of school. Uh, but there is a possibility that may, might not happen. And again, that's not the kind of news I want to be able to share and, and know that it's something that uh, parents and, and families have found very valuable. Parents, guardians, and families have found valuable. Uh, and if it's not up and running on the first day, we'll let you know as soon as it's ready to go. But fingers crossed that we'll have things ready to go for my stop as well. The last item that I wish to talk to you about is uh, we received some uh, additional guidance uh, from uh, the Minnesota Department of Health yesterday uh, in regards to what it's called the COVID-19 decision tree for people in schools. And a couple of very important things with this. Number one is uh, the Department of Health is considering anybody who comes into the school building, whether it's a student, an adult, uh, somebody who works there, uh, all considered to be the same. So it's not the set of ground rules for kids, the set of ground rules for adults. It's anybody who comes into a school setting. And they've done a couple of things that I want to make sure that you're aware of. So number one is they have uh, taken the symptoms for COVID-19 and they've broken them down into two categories. And the first category is called the less common uh, category, and that includes things like a sore throat, uh, you're being nauseous, uh, vomiting, chills, muscle pain, and there's a few more associated with that. And we're going to be putting this information onto our webpage. Uh, if you log on to the homepage, there's a COVID-19 uh, link uh, kind of about halfway down right next to where our safe learning plan is at. Click on that and that will be at the very top and this information from the Department of Health will be there. We've also generated a a letter uh, for families uh, to give them a bit more information with it. I know it's being shared uh, at the elementary buildings through, through open house and it's also available at the secondary level uh, for those families that might want some information around that as well. And we are expecting from the Department of Health a, a document that for more information for parents. Kind of wish we would have had it now uh, to, to share with you, but as soon as we get that, we'll put that on that COVID site as well. So I went on a little tangent there, sorry, I'll come back. So they've divided in two symptoms. One I talked about was the less common. The other is the more common. And the more common is things such as a fever greater than or equal to 100.4, new or onset, new onset and or worsening cough, uh, which goes back to my comment from earlier, thought that was out of there, now it's back in. Difficulty breathing, new loss of taste or smell. So they've got these two categories and then they've said, based upon those symptoms, here's going to be the expectation. So for people who have uh, just one of the less common symptoms, um, it's really kind of following what we've always done with uh, people who aren't feeling well. You, you check the symptoms, you check to see, can they stay in school? Can they, should they, do they need to go home, et cetera? And if somebody needs to be sent home, and they might be advised for them to go see a healthcare provider or go do a COVID-19 test. There's another set of parameters that go with that. But for the most part, uh, somebody who maybe has um, uh, one of the less common ones, maybe they got a sore throat or maybe they're feeling nauseous. If it's just one, then we're kind of following the same process, but, and, but it could lead to an assessment being done. And if there's COVID-19 positive, then there's a set of criteria that goes with that. If everything is good to go uh, and you can return to school or the program within 24 hours uh, after the symptom has improved. And a key piece with that is that siblings or other people in the household uh, contacts uh, do not need to do anything, do not stay home or quarantine. They can still come to school. They can still come to work. So again, and work being here in the school system. So not feeling very good. One of the, one of the less common symptoms treating it pretty much like we always have pre-COVID-19. And once symptoms, you're symptom-free, 
you can uh, come back to come back to school, come back to work, and then siblings and, and household contacts continue to do what they've normally done. I'm going a bit of a tangent here just for a moment. Apparently, I'm pretty good at doing these these days. Just a reminder for everybody that you know here in the Midwest we have a very strong work value, a very strong um, value to to go to work, to go to school. Uh, sometimes when we're probably not feeling the best, but there's something about well, I, I, I still went to work today. I didn't feel good, but I still went to work. In times of COVID, it's going to be really important that, A, we take care of ourselves to the best of our ability. And number two, if you're not feeling good, if you're exhibiting one of the uh, these less common symptoms or you're just not feeling good in general, uh, please um, do what's right for everybody around you, and that is you might need to stay home. Uh, there is nothing wrong with saying uh, that I, I, I'm just not feeling good and I need to stay home today. Uh, no, that doesn't mean that, um, that you know, it's, it's a vacation day or anything like that, but what it does mean is this work ethic and this value of, of coming to work or going to school when you're not feeling good uh, is kind of something we pride ourselves in. We need to rethink that a little bit for the safety of everybody that's, um, that's in the schools and for our community as well. So with that, I'll come back to now, what happens if somebody has one of the more common symptoms or if they have two or more of the less common symptoms. So now things start to change a little bit in terms of the recommendation from the Department of Health. And, and number one, again, you have to stay home. That is the, the one piece. And if you come to school and you, 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 you start to feel that way, you, you get sent home. And then there's a process that goes through in terms of of getting checked, getting assessed, uh, need to be sent home. Uh, do you need to go just go see your your doctor to get an alternative um, diagnosis. We're getting to that time of the year again where allergies tend to uh, tend to, to to rear up and show their ugly head. And so, if somebody is having two or more of the less common symptoms, but it's related to allergies, come on back once uh, that's that's uh, verified and you're good to go from there. That is just uh, part of living in in an area where there's more than one season, especially spring and fall tend to have more of an impact uh, than, than uh, the winter does, for example. So I want to let you know that, the, that this process is very clearly defined, and, and one of the key factors with it is that is that if somebody is not uh, has one or more of the common symptoms, more common symptoms, or two or more of the less common symptoms, it is going to impact what's going on in the household. And so people in that household uh, may need to or will need to uh, stay at home as well. And that's a change from what we normally have had up to this point. Do I wish we would have gotten this information uh, a while ago? Absolutely I do. Uh, getting it on September 1st or being made aware of it on September 1st with school being a week away and now it's September 2nd and sharing this with people uh, certainly is not the ideal for us. But like everything else we've been dealing with COVID, we'll, we'll work our way through this and, and uh, we together will find a way to make this uh, be as successful as we possibly can. Uh, and so just wanted to make sure I shared some of this. And again, more detailed information will be av made available on our website. There is a letter that's out there. And then again, once we get the letter from the Department of Health, we'll make sure that that becomes available for everybody as well. And then in addition to talking about the one common symptom, less common symptom, or, and two or more less common or one or more common symptoms, uh, in addition to that, that also talks about what happens for people who are close to somebody who has got a uh, been diagnosed or has a positive uh, test result for COVID-19. So it kind of lays out what that's going to look like as well. So just wanted to make you be aware of, uh, of information. Where as, as soon as we're getting it, we're, we're trying to make it be available and, and, and get that information out to people. And so I'm going to go ahead and set this document down right there for now. So uh, I think that's it for my part of questions and information that we've been getting. I'm going to reach over and start grabbing some of the questions that you guys are sharing with me. So our first question tonight is, should parents or guardians get a note from a doctor if their student has uh, chronic allergies? And, and I would suggest that, yes, that that be the, be the case. That can be on file uh, in the health office, and we can make, let staff know uh, what's going on with that. So if somebody has chronic allergies, what's to be expected with that? And uh, again, uh, we're also going to be getting into the not-too-distant future into uh, cold and flu season. And so some of these 
um, same symptoms mask themselves in terms of COVID-19, or you can say it masks itself in terms of symptoms that are related to allergies or, 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 or flu unrelated to, to COVID-19. So yes, I think that would be a really good idea. Again, it stems back to that piece that we've spent a lot of time talking about in these Facebook Live sessions is the importance of communication, timely communication. And so again, I think it would be a good idea if, you're, if a child has chronic allergies or if you are an employee in the district and you have chronic allergies, get that documentation uh, from, from a medical authority, share that with us so that we're aware of, of, of what those symptoms might be. Uh, this is a great question. Will schools provide a shield for students who receive uh, speech services? And the answer to that is no. Um, and uh, but we do have, as a, as a reminder, uh, we did get um, some shields from the state of Minnesota uh, as part of the plan uh, for, that the governor laid out in terms of providing a cloth mask. Uh, some disposable masks, and also uh, for our staff, there's some some face shields, etc. So, really, at the end of the day, um, if a face shield is is needed, we'll work with the families to try and find a way to make that happen. I think I mentioned a little earlier, we're trying to get our hands on some of those masks that might be available with the clear plastic piece. Just a reminder: a mask with any sort of a hole in it uh, that allows the droplets to go out won't work. Uh, so we can't have a, an open spot around the mouth, for example. So we'll certainly work with families to try help get those resources, uh, again, uh, as best we possibly can to, in order to help uh, the students get the services that they need in order to be successful. So the next question is, do students wear masks in class? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. They will be uh, wearing their masks in class. Um, we also know that as we begin the transition of having students come into school, uh, that this is going to be there's going to be a period of adjustment with that and and I know principals and, and and their staff have been really spending time talking about how can we help acclimate students to doing this uh, I, I myself have been wearing a mask for an extended period of time but I, I know that it took a little while to get used to it and so we'll be working with with students and families so to, to, to or not with students to help them make sure that we can maybe take some breaks periodically and do so in a safe manner. Uh, there is not the expectation that day one that students are going to come in and to the buildings and wear a mask all day long and not be able to take it off. That's just, that's not a, a realistic expectation, but it is a realistic expectation to make sure that our adults and our staff and, and, and our students are safe. And so if a mask break is needed, it will be done in a way that allows us uh, to do this safely to, so that people don't get sick. The next, uh, I actually grabbed two questions, and, and they're, they're somewhat related, and uh, I, 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 so I thought I'd grab both of them. And the first question is, is there talk about switching to uh, hybrid so anytime soon, and will the recent spikes uh, affect how we return to school? So great questions uh, to be asked, and, and so let me talk a little bit about what that's going to look like. So we have developed a process, and we're using a, a group that we're calling our COVID incident management team. And that includes people from uh, administration, uh, public health. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're also going to be able to get somebody from Centra Care as well. I know that I got some contact here the other day from somebody, and, and so hopefully they'll be joining us as well. And this team is going to meet on a weekly basis uh, every Thursday, and we'll look at the chart that uh, we'll look at a number of data points, including the chart that was sent out uh, as part of the Governor's Safe Learning Plan that uh, has been, quite honestly, has, there's been confusion around that, and so I want to clarify that. So that chart was designed for schools to make the decision in the base learning model. From there, it is not the data point. It is a data point because it gives us information of where things have been at and it's two weeks old. Uh, so when tomorrow when the newest round of data comes out, it will be for, for a two week period two weeks prior to, to tomorrow. And it'll be for data for a two week period from there. So it's it's actually going back data a month up to two weeks and then we'll pull we'll get that information and see where it's at. 
So as one of several data points that we'll be utilizing, uh, this, uh, this COVID incident management team will be looking at uh, gathering feedback from public health. How are we doing in our schools? We are the largest employer in, in Benton County, and we're going to know what's going on inside of our buildings uh, probably more even before it gets reported out to the county or it gets reported out to the Department of Health. So having our health office officials, having our school nurses giving updates, uh, talking about how are things going in the world of transportation, how are things going with food service, etc. We'll pull all of that information together and then from there look at seeing, okay, what are the next steps? Are we going up, but we're, it's, it's a manageable amount yet, we're still okay? Uh, are we, do we need to do something right now and make an adjustment in terms of where our model is at, either to become less restrictive or more restrictive? So this process is in place in order to make it be that it's not just a person that is making that decision, but again, gathering information to see where we're at. Now, is it true that we've had some increases uh, in, our, uh, in our active COVID cases? Yes, that is true. Uh, is it going to warrant uh, a change? We'll look at a number of different data points and see where that's at. And then once that information is collected, uh, it will be shared uh, with our staff. It'll be shared with the community and just in terms of bullet points of here's what we know, here's where we're at, here's what we believe is going on. And then if there's going to be anything done differently, uh, that will be in consultation between myself and the school board. Now, I will be the one to, uh, if there's a change, uh, it'll come via the superintendent's office to, to notify people, either less restrictive or more restrictive. Uh, but it, at this point, for me to say, well, I think this is where it's going would be premature. And I also think it's not honoring the system that we have put into place. And again, wanting to communicate with people as best we possibly can. So. Uh, Tomorrow is our first meeting. We'll be looking at data and we'll be communicating out uh, once we have a chance to take a look at a number of different uh, data points in terms of how things are going. Which leads me to uh, another one of my infamous tangents. And, and, and I do not want to sound preachy with this at all. It's not my intention and I do not want to sound disrespectful at all. But I am very concerned that, um, that, that what we do as a community uh, is going in terms of COVID-19 is really going to have an impact on us being able to provide the least restrictive environment for our students possible. And I, I, it's really important that regardless of where you're at, if, if you, if, if we as a community band together and practice those steps to limit the spread of this virus, what that will mean for us is less volatility in terms of how often we're moving, how restrictive are we going to be, is it going, is it going up, is it going down? And this is really tying the community and the schools together in a way that's a little bit different. Uh, oftentimes we've been tied together because of activities and events that happen in our buildings across the district, whether it be the community utilizing them, our students utilizing them, our staff utilizing them, etc. And uh, that, that's, that's, been, that, that, that's a really a key fundamental piece. Well now it's really going to be those things that are happening outside of our walls. We've done a lot of things to try and create the safest environment possible. And again, I encourage you to go to our safe learning plan to read about what some of those things are. We've put protocols into place. We've put practices into place that will best keep our staff and our students safe. And if we as a community band together and, and really work to try keep COVID at bay, it will mean less volatility for us in terms of movement up and down. And just as a gentle kind of a a reminder of what this means for us is that uh, if you go back to that scale that I talked about a little earlier for the base learning model and then a scale that we'll continue to use as a data point but not the decision maker is every four active cases of COVID in our community is a one point rise. And so what we choose to do in terms of face coverings, practicing good hygiene, um, those kinds of things, um, it will be really important. And I know we've got a, a tradition that happens and kind of signals the end of summer, the start of school, and that is the Labor Day weekend coming up. And I certainly 
am not advocating that anybody not spend time with family and friends uh, during the Labor Day holiday. I'm just asking you to think about some of those practices that are out there to, 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 with COVID-19 and, and can you do those? Because if you can, that will help us preventing the spread uh, of COVID and more importantly, we'll keep our children coming into school in a safe environment, being educated by their teachers, which we know they do an amazing job with and do a great job with, without having to do this bounce all over the place in terms of, well, this week we're in this model, in two weeks we're gonna be in this model. We'd like to keep that consistency as much as we possibly can, and we truly do need your help. So enough of my public service announcement. I'll move on to asking some more of the questions. And again, my intent with this was not to be preachy or to criticize or, do, or to do anything negative, but rather just to ask for your help and support uh, as we continue to try to find ways to keep our students coming into schools and working with our staff in the safest manner possible. Got a couple of mask questions here, and uh, the first question is, are the Storm logo masks for sale? And the answer to that question is yes, we do have some of them uh, for sale uh, through our DECA program. Please reach out to the high school, and uh, we can certainly, and certainly get you connected with those. In fact, hold on one second. Here is a sample of one of them that I purchased for myself. I purchased a couple of them. Uh, they seem to fit pretty good and don't pull in the ears quite so bad. And uh, for those of us who wear glasses, uh, you can get it up high enough so that's not fogging up your glasses. So you just reach out to the high school and, and yes, we have. And we also have a new uh, mask with the uh, Storm logo on it. And I, uh, I have gotten one, I haven't had a chance to use it yet, but those that have, have talked about it being much more comfortable. Again, not pulling on the ears quite so hard. The next mask question is, how are you dealing with kids who don't wear masks or have a doctor's note for not wearing one? Uh, so a couple, that's two, two questions. One, how are you dealing with kids who don't wear masks? Uh, the district's been pretty clear uh, that all students, uh, staff, and visitors, if they're allowed, uh, which right now we're trying, we're trying to limit that or not allowed at all, um, if, if you're coming into the building, you need to be wearing a, a face covering, an approved face covering. And with our students, uh, if they're choosing not to, uh, then we'll have the conversation that you need to. And if that's not, if that's not working, uh, then we'll have to have the conversation with the family about maybe distance learning is the best option. What I really don't want to see us do is get into a power struggle with this, but at the same time, we've got to keep everybody safe. And uh, in order to do that, the requirement is, is that we have to wear a face covering. And and uh, we'll work with families to make sure that's being followed. And for uh, the second part is or, who have a doctor's note uh, for, wearing, uh, for not wearing one. Uh, there may be those uh, very rare situations that um, um, a mask uh, or face covering uh, is, is going to cause a conflict. Uh, and the National Asso uh, Association of American Pediatrics are, uh, has really talked about that, that it should be a rarity with that, that most should be able to tolerate that at the K through 12 level. Uh, so I want to make sure that I mention that. And if they're not wearing one, uh, there will have to certainly be some different uh, social distancing components that come into play because we need to make sure that we're keeping everybody safe. And uh, be wearing a face covering uh, or not have wearing a face covering because of medical uh, documentation doesn't mean that you just get to go and do what everybody else is doing. There will certainly need to be some parameters put into place. But again, that's, that's gonna, it's, it's a rarity at this point, and I can continue to see that as a rarity. Uh, but we'll deal with those on an individual basis in order to keep that student, that child safe, as well as to keep the other children and the other adults in the building safe as well. So the next two questions are, are you requesting quarantines for kids, families who travel out of state? Uh, at this point, uh, I am not aware of any Department of Health recommendation for uh, quarantining for students, uh, for kids, families who travel out of state. I just want to come back to that piece I talked about earlier, and that is, you know, if you're going to uh, get together, uh, travel, etc., just practice those good um, those good practices for uh, prevention of the spread of COVID-19. Uh, face coverings, 
washing your hands regularly, practicing good social distancing. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to eliminate uh, doing the things that we, we sometimes like to do. And, and, and this has been really hard. This has been six, almost six months of people being asked to do things differently, and I understand that. But, but to the question is, if we do get a Department of Health or a CDC recommendation, then yes, of course, we would follow that. Uh, but at this time, there is uh, nothing uh, indicating that. The next question is, will the district keep an eye on cases in Stearns uh, because we have many students and staff that live there and, and we shop there? Again, um, we have students uh, that come to us from a variety of different places. And uh, so uh, will we be keeping an eye on those numbers? Yes, that's one of the many data, multiple data points. Many sounds like a whole bunch of them. It's one of multiple data points that we'll be looking at. How are, we do, how are things going on around us? And the key thing to remember with that is it's not, there's a number that's out there, but you got to dive a little deeper into that to find out where it's at. Uh, an example that I've shared with others is, is that uh, in, a, in a neighboring county, uh, there is the, the prison system. The prison is there. And there may be numbers that are showing up in Sherburne County, and, and I'm not saying that there is. So please don't take that and go and say, oh, I've heard from the superintendent that numbers in the prison system are going up. No, not saying that at all. But if the numbers are going up and it's for the, the people who, who don't get to leave from there for a period of time, that looks very different than if it is uh, for staff who are going in and out of their work there, for example. So there's a number of different moving parts to this. It's not just as simple as looking at the number. And that's why we're engaging as many people as we can, including public health, uh, and, and looking at this from a variety of different perspectives. Uh, if students who do not live in Benton County are going to school here and, and there is a uh, and, and there's a, a COVID-19 case with that, we'll know that right away because they're one of our students. And so again, it's, it's the data is reported back to this county where the student lives. It's just like there are students that live in Benton County that may be choosing to go to school in a non-Benton County school. And so again, that's why it's important that public health becomes a part of this because uh, they have a broader net to cast in terms of getting data for us, and so we're happy that they're a part of our team. Uh, the next question is, who is screening the kids? Um, is it the school nurse uh, reviewing the symptoms or someone who has medical training? So one of the things that we made the decision to do back uh, in July, uh, about the middle part of July, was to make a decision that uh, to put in um, temperature scanning devices uh, in all of our buildings. Uh, at the time, the CDC uh, had that as a requirement that everybody needed to be checked. Uh, and the idea of somebody standing there with a handheld uh, trying to scan everybody didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So the district made the decision to purchase the devices. And uh, we have them in multiple locations in each of our buildings. We also have uh, what we call a kiosk for our staff that are coming into a building. Again, trying to limit the crossing of people so students and the public will have one entrance uh, and then our staff will have a different entrance, but they're being scanned. Those devices will identify if somebody has a temperature over 100.4 .4 or greater. Uh, and it, uh, it's, it's fascinating, the technology will be notified right away. Uh, we'll be able to uh, go and check and find that, that, that person uh, right away and in a very discreet manner, uh, pull them off to the side and then they will go visit with uh, somebody in the health office for a screening to see where things are at. Because again, uh, the temperature is one of those more common symptoms that we're looking for. But again, it could be something as simple as uh, I've got uh, some allergies and I'm just I'm having a, uh, a temperature because of that. Uh, so yes, it is our health office officials and then our district nurses are working with those people to make sure uh, that, we're, that we're documenting and keeping track of that information. Uh, the next question is, will parents check their kids in and out if they are late or early? How does that process work? Um, again, I'm going to ask you to, to check with your schools uh, to, for that specific process because it may look different at each building. Uh, but one of the things that we need to be aware of 
is that uh, parents and guardians, uh, unless it's an emergency, are, are not going to be able to come into the buildings like we've done in the past. Uh, and I, I think at the elementary level, that looks a little different than maybe what it is at the secondary level, uh, particularly at the high school level. So again, check with your building to find out a little bit more of what that looks like, uh, because again, the specifics of it may vary from building to building. Uh, next question is, will there be leniency on absences? Um, and and, I, and I, I'm, I'm not sure this is the direction that the question was, uh, was going, but I'm going I'm to take it and, and try to answer it to the best of my ability. I think as a district, we've always tried to work with families when there are absences and when there are uh, definite reasons as to why I think there's a there's a leniency piece that goes with that. And I think we've done a good job of that over the years of of of, of communicating with families uh, when there are more absences than what we normally might expect. Uh, if there's an ongoing health issue, uh, if if there's a short term health issue, uh, I remember as a as a middle school student, uh, we called them junior highs back then, uh, dating myself a little bit there, but I, I broke my leg, and so I spent some time. Um, uh, out of school because I broke my, uh, the breaking of my leg, and I had doctor's appointments, and and again it really boils down to that communication piece. And 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 again, I think if you got something like that going on, of course we're, we're we're going to be understandable. It's when the communication breaks down, or there is an excessive amount of absences that that, that sometimes we got to try rein those things in a little bit, and maybe the leniency isn't there as much. But in times of COVID nineteen. Um, they, again, the, the, a student may have to uh, spend time at home for multiple days uh, because they've been in contact with somebody uh, that, 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 uh, that later on proved a test positive with COVID, for example. Of course we're going to be. We're going to try to provide education to the best of our ability uh, with, with students in those situations. So I think what it really boils down to and what I really want to emphasize here is that with absences, it is really important that you communicate. And, and I have found over my years that, that elementary parents are really good at making that phone call and letting the school know what's going on with their child. Uh, when you get to the secondary level, uh, it's, students are getting older. Uh, they're able to advocate for themselves differently maybe than a kindergarten or first grader does. And so there's less of that. But I think during times of COVID-19, uh, as a parent, as a guardian, please uh, know that, 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 that phone call to us to explain what's going on, my child's absent today because, or something is going on and, and, you, and they might be missing a, a, a series of days because of X, Y, or Z. It's really about that communication. And it's amazing how, to use this word here, lenient we can be and understanding we can be when there's that good two-way communication with families. And I want to encourage that. Uh, this next question says, I saw the Department of Agriculture extended free lunches for all kids. Will this be implemented immediately? Um, it was something I was going to share at the end of this, uh, at the end of my message, but it showed up here, so thank you for the question. Uh, yes, on August 31st, the um, USDA did announce the extension of a waiver for lunches to December 31st of 2020. Uh, what we what we don't know at this time is what are the specifics of that. And in fact, we've gotten some documentation from the Department of Education that just says, before you start making any changes to anything, let's find out what that means. So a waiver, it was really unexpected by everybody. It is welcome news. It, at this point, we don't know if it means exactly the same as what it did last spring. Don't know if it means exactly the same as what happens in the summertime. We're waiting for the Department of Education to provide more uh, documentation. Um, I, I wasn't in my office very much today, and I'll spend tonight afterwards, after this is over, uh, looking at emails, and hopefully maybe we've got some more guidance with that. But there's, there's cautious optimism that uh, that with the meal waiver program that it could be similar to what we've experienced in the past, uh, which would be welcome for, from my perspective, for our families in the community. Uh, it certainly makes things a lot easier for families who, um, that, that the paying for those meals might be a bit of a challenge for them. 
Uh, I still want to encourage people, please fill out the educational benefits form. Even if you choose not to access the the uh, services that you become available for. Uh, I'll, I'll share my own family, my mom and dad, very proud people, and, and I'm the oldest of four boys, very close in age, and, and each year qualified for a free lunch. And my, my mom and dad just said, nope, that's for other people, and, and we'll pay for our lunches. And I admire people that are that are willing to do that. And if you choose not to access those services um, and you're still eligible for them, that's a choice that you and your family will make. And again, gets back to those Midwest values that I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, but just know that it does make a difference for us as a school in terms of funding. And uh, we appreciate that. And, and, and again, um, at this point in time, we don't know for sure exactly what that waiver means. Again, cautiously optimistic that it's going to mean something similar to what we've experienced in the past. But as soon as we get more information, we'll make sure that uh, that gets communicated to people. So I grabbed three questions here, uh, and I'm going to you know, I know you're not supposed to look at your cell phone, but I anticipated this um, uh, question coming, so I did send out uh, a message in regards to this, so I'm going to take a look at my phone and read this. So the question is, why no lockers at the middle school? What will kids do with their co uh, coats and cold lunch? And so, the, the, yes, there are not, lockers are not being made available for, for, um, for students at the middle school, and the biggest reason is to limit exposures uh, because lockers can become a place of congregation. They also become very easy to get inside of that, uh, not practicing good social distancing. Uh, student supplies will be kept in the classroom. Uh, the students stay and, and the teachers rotate so the supplies can stay. And again, lockers are just too close to each other. And I think that that is, uh, that's a very wise decision. It's hard, uh, you know, lockers are, can, have been used by students for, for decades, right? Uh, although when I was a high school principal, it seemed like there was a lot more open lockers than anything else. So bottom line becomes that, yes, it is a change from what we normally do, uh, and that the reason why is to limit the exposure. The next question is, is there a plan for all students to get back to school eventually, even uh, those that, cho that choose distance learning? You know, uh, I would love to sit here and say to you that there's a plan in place, and on this date, everybody's going to come back to school. Uh, but I, I, I would I would simply not be being honest with you if I said that. Uh, that's why the the the, ch the choice is there for families with distance learning. Uh, that's why the choice is there for families to follow the model that uh, that that we're in right now. The the base model that we're looking at is all students back in in uh, in school, and and again, um, I I would certainly hope that this would happen. I'd love it to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, again, you hear conversations about a vaccine and, and what does that mean, but until we can do it safely, uh, it's just not a risk that we can take. Um, it, the, I'm not willing to put our kids and our staff in a position where their health could be compromised. And doing so purposefully, just it, it's not in my nature to do that. I just don't want to do that. I, People may disagree with decisions that are being made, et cetera, but I will always keep our student safety, our staff safety, and the educational needs of all in mind when it comes time for decisions being made. And I think Sock Rapids Rice Public Schools has a pretty strong track record for doing those kinds of things over the years. That just didn't start when I came here on July 1st. Uh, there's a, there a, a long record of superintendents and boards that have made really good decisions to keep people safe. Not everybody's agreed with them. Not everybody's thought they're the most popular in the world. But at the end of the day, doing what's right for kids. And until we can do so safely, uh, we'll be living in, in, in the models that we're currently are being made available to us. Uh, but again, let's, uh, let's hope that because we live in the greatest country in the world, in my own estimation, uh, and we have a lot of really bright people, that there will be a solution that will allow us to come back to some semblance of normalcy. I don't know if we'll ever be back to where we were on March 13th, 2020 and before. 
uh, but I'm sure hopeful and I'm optimistic uh, that it's going to be closer to that than where we're at now, and let's hope that that happens sooner rather than later. Next question is picture day for students who are distance learning. Please check with your school. Uh, we realize and understand that for students who are doing distance learning, some of those are because of medical complications or underlying factors. And so we want to make sure that for families uh, that we have a very prescriptive plan for that to, to help students with the pictures. And so please check with your school in regards to that. Next question here is, what will youth activities look like, robotics, et cetera? So where we're at right now with activities is that uh, for those that are governed by the State High School League, uh, the, the MSHSL, Minnesota State High School League, has made some determinations. Uh, they have postponed football and volleyball, although there will be a practice season for those activities, uh, I think starting on September 14th for, up, uh, for a three-week time period. Uh, and then for our spring activities, there's also going to be an opportunity for a practice session. Uh, I think that starts in October 3rd, I think, and through the 24th. I might have those days off a little bit, but it's in October, um, early October to towards the end of October. And it's, again, they get 12 days as well. And it's a little longer than 12 days, but we got MEA break in there. And, and there's ground rules and expectations with that. So that's for uh, category one main uh, activities. For category two, we're waiting for some direction uh, from the State High School League, whether that be debate or speech, uh, one act play, et cetera. Uh, the hope was is that they were hopeful that they'll get some direction uh, to us, uh, to the schools across the state of Minnesota, get that to us uh, before the school year starts. Uh, as soon as we get that information, uh, the activities office will be sharing with families and we're, and we're cautiously uh, optimistic that we'll get some direction with that here before the school year starts. But again, not gonna hold my breath waiting and that's not uh, derogatory towards anybody, just there's a lot of moving parts to making all these decisions and we wanna make sure that there's a good plan in place. For other categories, uh, for other activities, uh, that happen, uh, whether it be uh, ensembles, robotics, uh, et cetera. Um, when staff come back together uh, and start uh, working again in the buildings, uh, those advisors will be getting together with advisors from around the region and really looking at what options do we have to do this. Uh, you know, I, I, as a high school, as a former high school principal, um, music was an integral part of the of the building that I was in, and I used to love to go to the ensembles that uh, and and the showcases that would happen, uh, and just watch our kids excel. And 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 this would mean a bunch of kids coming together. Well, that's not going to be practical or possible during COVID nineteen. So, are there things that we can do? For example where things could be recorded and then they could be shared. Uh, could we do ensembles and have them come do them individually and then piece them together through technology? I, and, and, and again, these are just a couple of things that, that float through my mind and they're not, I'm not saying that's what is gonna happen, but it is conversations will be happening because we want to have kids participating as much as we possibly can. I know kids are craving it. I know kids want to be able to do it. And so let's try to do that in, a, in the safest manner possible. The next question has to do is how will notification be sent out when COVID is found in a building? Uh, the Department of Health uh, and the CDC have made it very clear, and it's been particularly with the Department of Health, very clear that um, COVID-19 is, uh, is private data. Uh, and so those who get notified will be those who have a right to know that or have an eminent right to know that. And so there is not going to be an announcement that comes out and says that there was three students at Sock Rapids High School, a Sock Rapids Rice High School that had diagnosed with COVID-19. It's not gonna be a general statement like that um, because we can't, it's private data. Those who are impacted by it or could be impacted by somebody with a COVID case, absolutely. And we'll get that communication from the Department of Health, and then it will roll out to the impacted families uh, and students from there. 
Uh, we also have received some support from the state of Minnesota uh, around the state, uh, not just we here in Sauk Rapids Rice, but around the state, and they're called regional support teams. And there's some people from the Department of Health, including an epidemiologist uh, that's a part of that, and they will also help us with that, uh, that communication and also the contact tracing that goes with that. So the, the key to this, in my estimation, is that we limit the number of questions like who's going to be contacted by trying to limit COVID coming into our building in the first place. And the way, the best way that we can do that is to follow those practices that are, that are really easy to do. Good hygiene, washing your hands, uh, doing the face covering piece. I know it's not easy, I get it. Uh, I've been wearing a face covering since the middle of July and it's not the most comfortable thing in the world but I'm willing to do it in order to be part of the COG to keep our staff and our students safe. And uh, I'm, I'm asking that everybody does what they can to, to, to help make sure that we do not have this bouncing all over the place with numbers. And it's not easy. Um, we want to go back to the way things were. So I think I've touched on that topic enough. I'll stop right there, but that's the answer to that question. So for distance learning, will there be band uh, class lessons virtually? Um, the, the, the answer to that question really is, that's getting into a detail piece, and I want to be very careful that I'm not uh, saying something that's inaccurate. So I really want you to check uh, with, your, with the administration uh, at the particular buildings. And, and, and again, that might be at the middle school and the high school, but would be the places to check with that. I think it's really important that you get accurate information. And as much as I'd like to say that I got a really good idea of what's going on, there's certain details that I'm not uh, aware of. And again, I think this is important. I'm, my children participated in music. I think music is an important part of, 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 a, of the experience uh, for students. It's not for everybody, I get that, but it, it, it really is part of that well-rounded experience and it's important for, for numbers of our students. So rather than me saying this is the way that it is, I think it's really important that you check because uh, the other piece is the uh, ground rules change a lot and this could be one of those where ground rules are continually changing. So please check with, uh, with your child's um, building administration to see where those are at for, for those who are uh, with band um, and class lessons for music. The next question is, what will Phi Ed look like for kids going to school? Um, that's a great question. And, and I, so I think a couple of pieces with that. Number one is, uh, Phi Ed is, uh, there's some activities that we've been used to doing uh, for periods of time that uh, we're not going to be able to do. I, mean, I don't have nothing that jumps in my head right away, but I'm just, I'm, I'm anticipating that that might be the case. But we still have standards to cover. We still have expectations that we need to do. And those standards, those expectations will still be covered, but we might be doing it differently in order to keep everybody safe. Phi Ed, as much as we possibly can, uh, will be taking place uh, outside. Um, I think that that is the, the safest way for us to make sure that we're social distancing and also giving kids a mass break. Uh, and it's part of the safe learning plan, if you look at that, that is one of the exemptions for a mask to be removed, a face covering to be removed, is when uh, they're exerting themselves during Phi Ed, et cetera. So just uh, wanna make you, uh, so Phi Ed is going to still be happening. It's gonna look, some of the activities might look a little different. The standards still have to be covered. And uh, we, uh, if, if it's possible to be in the gym uh, and utilize some of those spaces, as long as we can social distance, as long as we can make sure uh, that we're keeping the space safe, uh, we'll continue, we'll do that. So, I just got the two minute warning. Uh, so, I, I said this last time, time flies when you're having fun and, uh, and uh, uh, this is, I do enjoy getting the opportunity to come in front of you uh, each week and, and share uh, and try to answer your questions because I think that's part of what superintendent's responsibility is to do is to try and answer people's questions and, 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 and I do enjoy this format. So with that, a uh, couple of parting comments. Number one, 
Uh, as we continue to get more information from the CDC, the Department of Health, and the Department of Education, we will continue to update our safe learning plan. So again, continue to check with that on a regular basis uh, for updates. And then the last piece is, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I want to talk about it again. If you or someone else you know has a four-year degree and four-year college degree, and it can be in anything, if you got a four-year degree and you'd be interested in learning more about being a substitute teacher, please reach out to our human resources department. Um, people will still get sick with non-COVID related things. People still need to go to the doctor. Still, people still need to do those things that happen, COVID or not. And uh, our, our staff do an amazing job, but sometimes they have to be absent. And uh, if you're interested in coming to help us out, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, just reach out to our HR office and we'll try to get you the information that's needed. I think that is it for this edition of the Storm Forecast. Again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I will, um, I'm tentatively planning to do a session uh, next, uh, next Wednesday as well. Uh, that will be after the second day of the school year. Just a reminder uh, that we are doing a slow start uh, to the school year. Not everybody's coming back at the same time. We've all got to learn new, what new school looks like, whether you're a staff member or you're a student, uh, whether you're new to the district or have been going to school here for 13 years. Uh, we're going to be doing things a little differently. So it's really important that we understand what are going to be the ground rules, what are going to be the expectations. And so at the secondary level, it's a two-week rollout at the elementary level. Uh, it's a one-week rollout simply because at the elementary level, we can keep kids more isolated and they're more in their pods or groups uh, all day long. And so I uh, feel comfortable in doing that. So uh, kids uh, will be starting next week and, and we're looking forward to having them back in the building. It's been great to have our staff as well. So uh, just... Uh, be, be safe. Uh, let us uh, communicate with us when you have questions. And in the meantime, take care and go store. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.